Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I've got my giant glass of water here. And I got my phone to time myself. Um, so I have to say thank you to um, everyone here. Thank you to uh, Karen and to Patrick and to Brad and to Greg and everybody for inviting me to be here and pulling this together. I'm very excited about it. Um, as, as is most of the things that I've discovered in my life, I at first thought, oh, I don't have time to do that. And I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't know that I would actually fit in here. I didn't know that this would be um, such a health-oriented group um, and, and really looking to science and information. I just always thought CrossFit was about working out and getting really ripped and stuff. So is this, this is annoying me. Does that work? Everybody hear me all right? All right. Um, so yes, I'm a journalist, um, and sort of like the Barack Obama story, uh, I was in covering the banking industry when Reuters asked me to move to Kansas and start covering food and farming. And I thought, terrible idea, right? You know, who wants to do that? Uh, I liked wearing my blue business suits, wasn't really into the blue jeans and mud boots, but I moved to Kansas and, um, you know, started really what has become now a 21-year journey, um, I say, through our nation's food and farming system. And, you know, I've been literally in hundreds of farm fields around the United States with farmers from California uh, to Florida and the orange groves there and up and down the Dakotas to Texas and Kansas and uh, Iowa, you know, where corn, you know, stretches as far as the eye can see. And I've spent time with um, seed scientists, soil scientists, weed scientists. I didn't even know there was a weed scientist, right, in career until I started uh, this, this journey. Um, and I've spent a lot of time with policymakers and regulators, the USDA, FDA, EPA, uh, and with Monsanto, um, BASF, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, these very big and powerful companies that sell the seeds and sell the chemicals um, that our farming and food production system is based on. So what I've learned, um, I didn't start out with any sort of preconceived notions. I didn't worry about GMO or non-GMO or pesticides or anything like that. But what I've learned over these 21 years is that we have created a profound problem for ourselves. We have a pesticide-dependent de food production system. Um, and health experts around the world recognize and tell us that pesticides you know, are tied to a range of human ailments, um, human illness and uh, disease, as well as environmental problems. Um, but the companies that sell these, Monsanto and DuPont and BASF and others, have convinced our policymakers that the rewards, fighting bugs and insects and um, plant diseases, that those are worth the risks. Um, but what, what I'm hearing from scientists, what I've learned with farmers, and, and the point of the book and the work that I'm doing is that that's not really the case, and that's where the decades of deceit come in. Um, what the companies are telling us and what they're telling our regulators and our lawmakers is really more protective of corporate profits than it is protective of public health. So in the first chapter of my book, and I always like to go back to Rachel Carson, um, because if you're familiar with Rachel Carson, you know she was a very um, renowned scientist and she was a wonderful author. And she wrote in the 1950s and 60s about uh, the dangers of chemical use to the natural world. And she wrote her book, Silent Spring, published in 1962. Um, and she focused there about DDT, but, you know, and what, what DDT could do um, to the environment and to human health. But her message was larger. It was really about... Uh, the dangers that we face with unchecked pesticide use and what that could bring if we didn't recognize the dangers and do something about it. And thankfully, people did. Um, you know, we saw the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency in the early 1970s. We saw um, many environmental defense organizations uh, start up. And, you know, there was this notion that we did need to protect our health, protect our natural world. But what where we are now, you know, we, we have lost that sense of balance. We have lost, um, you know, that, that resonant, that uh, lesson. And we've, we've swung to a place where we need to, I think, recall this quote, and that's why I have that up here, and this is why I have that in my book. Um, but I think it's very important that we regain that sense of balance. 
What is a pesticide? I have to throw this in because usually um, after a talk or during a talk, or I'll get emails later, people will say, you are so stupid. You know, weed killers, you talked about weed killers. They are not pesticides. Well, yeah, they are. So I just want to point that out. For legal and regulatory purposes, um, this is the definition of a pesticide. So it would include insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, all sorts of sides. Uh, this is what I call my not-so-fun facts. Um, over a billion pounds of pesticides used in the United States each year. About 5.6 billion pounds of pesticides used worldwide. Our USDA estimates that about 50 million Americans get drinking water from groundwater that is potentially contaminated by pesticides and other agricultural chemicals. Atrazine, in particular, is one of those I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and research, of course, as I said, ties pesticides to a range of health problems, uh, reproductive and neurodevelopmental harm, kidney, liver disease, and cancers. Cancer is, is common. I'm sometimes asked this question. Raise your hand if you know anybody who has cancer. You've had it yourself in your life. No hands raised. I don't believe that. <laughs> Yeah, it's 38% of men and women in the United States are expected to be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetimes. And that, to me, is a really stunning figure. Um, I've, my son's, you know, a 16-year-old friend has cancer. A neighbor down the block, I've lost a good friend to cancer not too long ago. Um, as all of you know, we see ads on TV. We are supposed to live with cancer. We are supposed to cut off body parts and radiate and, um, and accept cancer and take a lot of drugs uh, and drug treatments. But there are a number of scientists out there, leading scientists in literature that says, and much like our CrossFit found, you know, Let's not get cancer in the first place, right? Let's, let's realize what are the risk factors that we can do something about. You can't do something about genetic disposition or other things, but you can do something about pesticides. Um, you can see here estimated national expenditures for cancer care, one, $147 billion. That was for 2017. Uh, there's an economic impact uh, to this disease um, incidence as well that we should all keep in keep in mind. Um, and this, you know, I'm a mom. I've got three kids. Um, cancer rates are rising in kids. You know, children under five in particular, you can see childhood leukemia, brain tumors, um, liver tumors. We, we are getting sicker. We need to pay attention to that. So three commonly used. There's so many here, but these are just three I wanted to talk about really br briefly. Glyphosate, and I will get back to that. Um, it's been in the news. People probably know that word now, glyphosate. A few years ago, most people didn't. It is the most widely used herbicide in the world. It's been tied to cancer uh, as well as kidney and liver problems and reproductive problems. You have atrazine, as I mentioned, which is uh, pretty commonly found in drinking water around the country, especially in the springtime uh, after farmers use it in their fields. It's tied to birth defects, low fetal birth weight, um, problems with fetal survival. And chlorpyrifos um, is a really interesting one. This one was um, developed and marketed by Dow Chemical, impairs childhood brain development. There have been very robust studies, and, and there is a real scientific consensus that this does uh, neurodevelopmental harm to children, both if they are in utero and their mother is exposed or uh, when they are very young. Damages the cognitive function, affects IQ, uh, ADHD, all sorts of things. It's so damaging that it's been banned from household use. It was supposed to be banned um, uh, from agricultural use and food production in 2017. Uh, but in 2017, we got a new president, we got a new administration. Dow Chemical chipped in a million dollars to the inaugural fund and uh, sent some lobbyists to visit him, and the ban on chlorpyrifos went away. We have these three common routes of exposures, dermal, inhalation, dietary. It's all pretty, you know, everybody would think that, I suppose. Um, dermal, you know, if you're out in a field or if someone near you is spraying or you're spraying in your yard, it absorbs into your skin. Inhalation, the same way. Dietary, a lot of people don't think about that necessarily. Um, but even if you don't live near a farm field, even if you don't use any pesticides in your home, you are being exposed to pesticides every day in your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, and in your water. Unless you're growing your own food exclusively with your own soy. Like, there are so many different things that you would have to do to avoid pesticide residues in foods. 
So this is a report. These come out every year. The Food and Drug Administration uh, puts out these giant uh, reports, as does the FDA. And annually, they test foods, um, several thousand food samples usually, uh, for pesticide residues because of that, because we know that they are commonly found in food, and they want to look and see sort of what are the levels, where are they, where's, where are potential dangers. And this one just was published in September uh, last month, and you can see fruits and vegetables, our healthiest foods, right, what we're supposed to be eating, um, tend to have very high uh, prevalence of pesticide residues. You see, what is that, 84% in fruits, 53% in vegetables. You see it in grains. Um, now, the red, the blue bars, is where you find pesticide residues. The red is what our government tells us we need to worry about. The EPA says, and the USDA and the FDA, but it's up to the EPA to set the level. The EPA says, as long as it's within a certain level, as long as these residues are within a certain legal limit or a tolerance level, don't worry about them in your food. It's fine, doesn't matter. What they don't really like to point out is the way they go about setting those tolerance levels, those legal levels, um, are in collaboration with the pesticide industry. The companies that are selling the pesticides are the ones telling the EPA where those legal limits should be. And in the, you know, <laughs> in the example of glyphosate that, that uh, I just find so outrageous, you know, for oats and wheat and things like that, the legal limit, the legal level has gone up over the years, just over and over and over and over again. And so they say it's fine, it's within legal levels. They don't tell you those legal levels keep increasing as these pesticide companies want to push more and more of these um, pesticides into use. This is just another slide I like to show. All of the, this isn't even the whole thing, you know, but these are some of the pesticides that uh, the FDA is finding in our food in this most recent report. Uh, 221 different pesticides found in food samples, including DDT, which Rachel Carson wrote about so long ago, which is actually banned, which we shouldn't be finding in our food but it persists in the environment. That's a, you know, what is so dangerous about these pesticides is that they do persist in the soil, uh, in the water, in our own bodies. This is what I was telling you about uh, a little bit earlier, chlorpyrifos. California has stepped up. Um, you guys are all lucky to be in a state that seems to care most about uh, public health. Chlorpyrifos, as I just showed you the slide of the FDA, it was the seventh most prevalent pesticide found uh, among all of the 221 different pesticides. Chlorpyrifos, as I said, is known to be neurodevelopmental uh, damaging to children. California has stepped up and said, we're going to ban this. The USDA won't do it. The EPA, the FDA, our lawmakers, the Trump administration, no one else is going to step in, but we'll step in. Um, what we're seeing in Washington now is a move uh, for preemption to uh, put into place legislation that would make it uh, impossible for states and cities and localities to regulate uh, pesticide use. So this is my baby. This is a poster child. Um, Monsanto and glyphosate. As I said, glyphosate is the most widely used herbicide um, in the world. And the the way that it came to be the most widely used herbicide in the world and came to be so pervasive in our food and in our water uh, is the story that I write in Whitewash. And I think it is a great poster child because what this company did and the rise of this chemical is, is what you see, what you saw in the tobacco industry, what you've seen a little bit in the pharmaceutical industry. It's a lot of manipulation of science. It's a lot of um, pushing regulators and policymakers to look the other way when they have studies that show that this might be tied to cancer, that this might be tied to other diseases. Um, it's been a great product for Monsanto. They uh, introduced glyphosate-based herbicides in 1974. Um, it was quickly embraced. It was a novel herbicide, could kill weeds much more quickly and effectively uh, than other herbicides that were on the market at that time. And it is much safer um, on an acute basis, much safer than some other herbicides. There are, there are ones out there that are used. There's one called Paraquat, for instance, that uh, farmers used to use quite a bit, and they still do use. But it's so deadly that if a farmer would accidentally get a little bit you know, on their tongue, they would, they would have a splash or they would get some, they would generally be dead within two to three weeks. Um, so when glyphosate came around, 
farmers loved it and they embraced it. And cities and parks, um, it's now sprayed everywhere. It's sprayed aerially over forest. It's used around utility, um, uh, rights of way, homeowners, you know, residential. A lot of people here might use it. I don't know, around your sidewalks and things where grass pops up. Very, very commonly used golf courses. Um, it's so so widely used that the U.S. Geological Survey has found it in rainfall samples. Uh, they find it in waters and streams, they find it persisting in the soil, and they found it as well in, in air samples. It's even found in our own bodies in human urine. So if you get your urine checked and you want to look for pesticides, you're probably going to find glyphosate in it. So the World Health Organization and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, this is what they do. They look at widely used substances for which there is a concern that they might be carcinogenic. This group uh, took up uh, glyphosate, and in 2015, they, they did an evaluation. They don't do new studies. What they do is they look at published literature that is already out there, and there had been quite a lot of literature on glyphosate because it was so widely used. And researchers around the world from the 1980s and 90s and 2000s were doing studies to see, you know, are these, is this chemical really as safe as Monsanto tells us? Monsanto has said, you know, safe enough to drink, safer than table salt. Uh, we don't need many restrictions on it. We can spray it directly over these cool genetically modified crops that we've rolled out. Uh, you can spray it directly on wheat and oats right before you harvest them. So a lot of scientists were looking at this. The International Agency for Research on Cancer did a review of all the literature. They brought in top cancer scientists from around the world, uh, including one from our own EPA, uh, and one from the National Cancer Institute and others, and they determined that the weight of evidence showed that this was a probable human carcinogen. And this is how they break it down. They look at the uh, epidemiology and the toxicology and mechanistic data. And you can see here they saw you know, sufficient evidence that was in the toxicology. They saw just limited evidence in the epi. Um, and again, it is very difficult, as these scientists will tell you, um, to establish causation through epidemiology, right? Because there are so many different factors. But they found limited evidence and they said um, they found a particular association to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Their mechanistic data, they found very strong evidence, they said. Um, they saw DNA damage in populations and, and exposures um, compared to non-exposures. So. What happened then is an explosion of litigation, right? Because so many people are using this and so many people have non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So you saw um, this explosion of litigation. We're now up to 18,400 plaintiffs, um, approximately. They all allege that their non-Hodgkin lymphoma is due to their exposures to Monsanto's formulations, Roundup and Ranger Pro and other glyphosate-based herbicides. But importantly, all of their allegations in all of these lawsuits also say that Monsanto knew about the risks and failed to warn them. So they're saying, not only does it cause cancer, but Monsanto hid the risks. And the jury so far, we've had three trials, and all of, you know, and they've been weeks and weeks long, um, but all three juries and all three trials have found unanimously that yes, the weight of evidence shows us that it causes non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and yes, Monsanto's been lying about it and hiding that for many, many years. The juries came back, the first one with a $289 million verdict, $80 million in the second, and a $2 billion verdict in the third trial. The judges in those um, trials have reduced them all. They thought that the verdicts were um, excessive um, because the punitive damages were so high. So they've reduced those. And the, the first one is um, up before the California Appellate Court right now, and uh, there should be a decision within the next few months on that. But the juries did find, uh, to issue these punitive damages, they had to find that Monsanto had acted with malice in failing to warn of the risks. So what's come about through all of these trials, is really cool if you're a journalist, um, is discovery documents. Monsanto's had to turn over several million pages of its own internal emails and reports and correspondence. Uh, and this is really how the lawyers have built that case. And I already had when I, I wrote my book before there was ever a trial, but I had I already had a lot of this information through Freedom of Information Act requests. 
um, from the EPA, FDA, and USDA. So I didn't, I wasn't able to see into Monsanto's internal correspondence, only their correspondence with these regulatory agencies. But you could see um, there, there is just such a weight of evidence, um, thousands and thousands of pages that show an effort to manipulate science, manipulate regulators, manipulate consumers. So I'm just going to show you a few of these. Um, some people like to see these. But so Monsanto, after the International Agency for Research on Cancer said this is a probably human carcinogen, Monsanto publicly said, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Those crazy scientists are relying on you know, junk evidence, and they're politically motivated, and there's no evidence whatsoever. But what you see internally is that before this even went to IARC, Monsanto was very worried. And they talk internally. They say, what we have long been concerned about has happened. Glyphosate is on for IARC review. We have vulnerability in the area of epidemiology, exposure, genotox, mode of action. So then they go on and they predict that they're going to get a rating of a possible or a probable human carcinogen um, by this International Cancer Agency. This is all before the, the scientists even met. And then they decide what they're going to do about it. And this, again, this is before they even got a rating. So they decided that they were going to orchestrate outcry. They were going to try to discredit these cancer scientists and invalidate what they were sure would be a probable or a possible human carcinogen. And one way they decided they wanted to do it was they wanted to have some new papers written that would proclaim the safety of their herbicide and would counter the IARC finding that they were sure was going to come. Um, so they talk about this internally, and you can see this is a scientist, um, a senior scientist at Monsanto, and he's writing about what can we do? Well, we think we should, maybe we could get a series of papers and they could be published, and you know, we're gonna do this and that. Um, an option would be to add Grime and Keir Kirkland to have their names on the publication, but we would be keeping the cost down by us doing the writing. They would just edit and sign their names, so to speak. And that, in the scientific world, is called ghostwriting. And you can see they use the word ghostwrite. We can ghostwrite. Um, and importantly, they note here, recall that is how we handled William Crows in Monroe 2000. Well, nerdy people like me who follow the science on this stuff uh, said, oh my god, William Crows and Monroe is like a fundamental foundational paper that the EPA and regulators around the world have held up and said, look, it's safe. That's why we can allow these increasing levels on our food, and that's why nobody has to worry about it. It's why we don't need a big warning label on it, um, you know, telling people it can cause cancer or other things. William Crows and Monroe. Well, you know, and there they're saying they ghost rate it. Here's William Crows and Monroe. These were the findings. Roundup herbicide does not pose a health risk. No effects on fertility or reproductive. Glyphosate is non-carcinogenic. That's the paper that we just learned from this internal email that Monsanto considers that they ghost wrote. So we get back then to this these series of papers that they're planning, right? So this was eventually published. This was published in September 2016 in Critical Reviews in Toxicology. And they called it a review of glyphosate carcinogenic potential by four independent panels. And to stress the independence, there's a declaration of interest that says neither any Monsanto company employee nor any attorney reviewed any of these manuscripts prior to submission to the journal. But internally, what we see are a whole long list of you know, things that they did to this journal. And you see, again, Bill Hydens and others, um, you know, I wrote a draft chapter back in November. I'm going to go back. I'm going to refresh. You have pages and pages of them editing and changing. We have contracts where they're paying these authors, these independent authors, um, secretly uh, under the table. Um, you know, it, was, it was a direct deceit, but... Uh, these got a lot of attention. They're still out there. They're still called, you know, independent expert panel reviews. Um, and they have been treated as, as authentic independent review of glyphosate that counters this interna International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, the publisher, when this all did sort of come out, the publisher did try to retract the papers, did say that they were going to retract them. Uh, they didn't say it publicly. They said it in emails, again, that we have. Um, but the editor refused to do it, and uh, it's been quite a controversy. But, but for someone who doesn't know the backstory, this is what they would see in the published peer-reviewed literature. More examples of ghostwriting. Um, this is a guy, David Saltmaris, he's another scientist at Monsanto. He's talking about you know, having ghost-written, ghost-wrote a cancer review paper, Grime et al. 
This is another paper that's in the published literature. The sky, I love this one. This is just so crazy, right? Monsanto scientist John Vicini. Now, this was about GMOs. It wasn't about glyphosate. But he's written a paper, and he wants to get it out there. And it's talking about how safe GMO crops are for livestock feed, actually. Um, the best case scenario would be for it to look like it's a non-mon paper, to look like it came from somebody else. And he's concerned the faculty members, the academics they're going to try to rope in, may not want to just take something they did not produce and slap their names on it. He's a little worried he's not going to be able to find somebody. So the judges in these cases so far, these are just a couple quotes, um, they have been rather outraged at what they've seen in the evidence themselves. And this is the federal judge, fair amount of evidence, he says, that the only thing Monsanto cared about was undermining the people who were raising concerns about whether Roundup caused cancer. Monsanto didn't seem concerned at all about getting at the truth of whether glyphosate caused cancer. And you see a similar quote from uh, the Superior Court judge. But this is really, you know, what the bulk of my, my work and my writing talks about is not so much the science. I'm not a scientist, and I think that scientists can debate this all day long. But the deception is not in dispute. Um, and that is what's running our federal policy, and that is what's running consumer um, expectations uh, and knowledge. And I think you know, that's what is so dangerous to us. This is just another example, I guess, uh, of what you might call ghostwriting. This is a, a company, Potomac. Uh, in a, it's a media house. And they were writing, this again was to defend the safety of glyphosate. Monsanto wanted op-eds uh, in newspapers around the country that would talk about how crazy this international cancer group was and how safe these chemicals really were. But of course, we didn't want it to look like it came from Monsanto. So this group was hired to put together these op-eds and then find somebody to be the author. You see that in quotes. And you see they say, we know these items in the media need to be from those outside the industry. The industry is smart. They know if it looks like it comes from them, like we're all going to have a bit of skepticism or we're all going to factor that into um, our, our perspective. But if you think it comes from someone outside, someone who is independent, uh, you might give it more credibility. And that is sort of what they hang all of this on. What these documents show us, what we've seen, I talked about the ghost-written papers. We also see uh, where they provide alternative assessments. So when scientists at the EPA or otherwise um, do say, my gosh, this looks like it causes cancer, um, what the companies can do is they come in and they provide an alternative way for them to interpret the science, an alternative assessment. And we've seen that happen uh, with Monsanto and glyphosate and, and others. Dow and chlorpyrifos, for instance. You see networks of European and U.S. scientists um, who are on the dole. That's probably not the right word to use, but money is flowing in and uh, collaboration and positive propaganda messaging is flowing out uh, of universities around the country, which is really disturbing um, to a degree. Uh, these academics are most often not disclosing their funding. Again, you know, it's fine if you want to do it, but disclose it so people understand that potentially there's a conflict of interest. But there are scientists at University of Nebraska, University of Florida, University of California, Davis, all around the country that we know that have been collaborating behind the scenes in exchange for money for their programs and not disclosing it. Um, public relations teams, as I talked about, uh, they have public relations teams that are not only ghostwriting, um, there's not only ghostwriting for scientific studies, but um, articles that appear in Forbes magazine or in uh, USA Today and other places. Articles that look like they're coming from someone um, who is independent, but in fact, these articles we see have been ghostwritten by a PR firm for Monsanto or another chemical company. And then finally, um, they put together front groups. So if all of the ghostwriting doesn't work and all of the academic assistance and collaboration doesn't work, they have these front groups that work to try to discredit people like me and people like the scientists at the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer, people like Linda Birnbaum, uh, one of the leading government toxicologists uh, in the country who's been trying to warn about the dangers of chemicals. Um, so these front groups, again, they often have very, um, you know, authentic sounding names, Academics Review, Sense About Science, Genetic Literacy Project, American Council on Science and Health. That one sounds really authoritative, doesn't it? Um, but what you see 
This again, these are all emails that we'd love to get. Um, Academics Review was set up um, by University of Illinois professor who Monsanto had been very chummy with and, and funding his program. And you can see that, you know, this is, this is um, founded to ensure that sound science is widely and easily available to inform us all. But what we see from the email is that when they were setting this up, this is Monsanto, this is uh, Eric Sachs, and they're saying, okay, it's going to be really important to keep Monsanto in the background, right? Nobody needs to know. Um, and oh, by the way, I'm just sending some more money to your university. Um, and they don't disclose that. American Council on Science and Health, this is a really aggressive one. They have been really vocal and really out there. And people for American Council on Science and Health regularly have articles and columns in Forbes magazine, in USA Today, and number, Washington Post, a number of other um, outlets. And they proclaim to be, you know, again, an authentic science-based organization weighing in on topical issues um, that pertain to public health. Um, but what we find is that they are funded by the people that they are defending. And so here's an email. They had been asking Monsanto for more money. Um, you know, you gave us a lot. We need a lot more. And this is Monsanto saying you will not get a better value for your dollar than ACSH. And this is what they do uh, with this. So this is another email on the left, they, writing back to Monsanto, saying, each and every day we work hard to prove our worth to companies such as Monsanto. And one of the things they do is they attack people like me. So yeah, um, there are, I've lost count, 20 different articles, I think, on their website about what a terrible person I am and a terrible journalist. Um, but they're not super original because they use, they do the same thing with New York Times, Danny Hakeem, Eric Lipton. Eric Lipton is a science birther. He won a Pulitzer, but he's a science birther. Um, the idea is to smear journalists, to, to establish some doubt, to establish you know, a lack of credibility so that when people like Danny and Eric or myself are telling you this information or writing articles um, that it will be considered um, invalid or discredited. This is another example. It's not only you know, journalists, as I said, scientists. Um, these are based on emails. This came from uh, Lee Fong at The Intercept. And this was how Monsanto basically used um, Republicans in Congress to try to strip funding from the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, and again, it was made to look like it didn't come from Monsanto, that it just originated from these worried lawmakers. Um, but we see is that it was all scripted by Monsanto. And that's a good story if you wanted to read it. So what has happened through all of this sort of push and pull and ghostwriting and deception and academic collaboration, what has happened for Monsanto is the use of glyphosate has skyrocketed. Um, Genetically engineered crops were introduced in 1992. This revolutionized agriculture. We were spraying weed killer for the first time right directly over crops um, that we were going to harvest and use for food to feed people and animals. And um, you know, a whole lot of scientists said that's a really bad idea. But Monsanto said, no, it's fine. It's great. It's not going to hurt anybody. Don't worry about it. And so what we've seen is skyrocketing use, about 40 million pounds a year in the 90s. We're up to about 300 million pounds a year now. This is just in the US. Um, globally, it was about 125 million pounds in the 90s and about 2 billion pounds now. Um, and that's why this chemical, as I said, is so pervasive um, that you're going to find it in food and water and air and your own bodies. Um, I talked about genetically engineered crops. It's not only used with genetically engineered crops. It's used in orange groves and vineyards, and it's used in the production of almonds and watermelons and, as I said, wheat and um, a whole array of foods um, to suppress weeds and to help the farmers you know, fight off uh, the weeds, which compete uh, for nutrients and water and things. And so it does help farmers uh, produce more food, generally, uh, if they can do that. We have found, uh, environmental scientists have found that as, as the farmers rely on this, uh, the soil health deteriorates, uh, the nutritional value of the crops are deteriorating, um, weed resistance is developing. So it's not, again, necessarily a good thing for the rest of us, um, but it's been a really good thing for the companies selling these herbicides. 
So back to the food. Um, FDA, uh, this is a story that I did, again, based on freedom of information requests. The FDA doesn't tell anybody this, and they don't publicly report this. But internally, one of their scientists um, a couple of years ago was doing some sampling, and he brought in uh, honey samples from around the United States and was looking at this for residues of glyphosate. And he found what he considered to be alarming levels of this weed killer in honey, including in organic honey. And so he reported this to his boss, and his boss basically said, don't worry about it. We're not going to get upset about it. We don't need to report it. It's fine. The scientist said, well, but I think it would be considered illegal. It would be con these levels would be illegal in Europe. Um, we don't have a tolerance here in the United States. And the, and the uh, administrator said, again, don't worry about it. So this chemist then went on to test oatmeal products. And he brought in baby food and other things in oatmeal products and found, again, you know, significant levels of this uh, weed killer in these oatmeal products and was alarmed about it. Went to his bosses, and again, they said, don't worry about it. We don't need to publicly report it. It's not part of any official sampling. And oh, by the way, you're going to be reassigned so that you no longer are going to be testing for pesticide residues in foods. And uh, that is the case today. He is not allowed to be doing that. Another scientist, uh, this one was out of Arkansas, was, was doing some testing again. This is, again, not anything that the FDA will tell you. You have to sue them um, to get internal documents, which I had to do. Um, but they're finding this, you know, he, he writes to his supervisors and he says, I've brought all this stuff from home, wheat crackers, granola, cornmeal from home. There's a fair amount of glyphosate in all of them. And he says the only thing he couldn't find it in was broccoli. Um, so, but again, none of this has been reported publicly in that nice little thick report that I, that I told you about. So... What we're finding, this is San Diego um, Medical School researchers. They have been tracking people and levels of glyphosate in their urine for many, many years, 20-some years. And what they have found is that um, the prevalence and the levels of glyphosate in the subject's urine has been rising significantly over the years, which why would we be surprised at that, right? Um, these are some studies that have been done. Uh, this is the... Um, Rosmini Institute, uh, they're just finding, you know, and there's still a lot of debate. This is not established. There's not a consensus on this. People are still trying to understand what is this chemical doing to our bodies. Um, but they are finding capable of modifying the gut microbiota, which is something that's very concerning to scientists because that's so important to so many, um, you know, bodily, <laughs> bodily functions and disease and the immune system and all of that. And these are our pediatricians, you know, and our, the pediatricians, again, are saying pesticides. You know, there is a problem. Epidemiology evidence um, demonstrates association between early life exposures to pesticides and pediatric concerns. And again, it's not just glyphosate. This is the poster child, what I'm saying, for the much bigger problem. We have to be aware of what we're doing to our children. This is um, from Linda Birnbaum. I mentioned her earlier. She just retired October 3rd. She uh, was the leading toxicologist really in the world. She ran our National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences and our National Toxicology Program. And she has been trying to beat the drum and sound the alarm and say, we are not protecting public health. We're not protecting our children. Our regulatory system is not keeping up with the science that is showing us that these things are dangerous and we need to do something about it. She was nearly run out of office for that. She became subject to an investigation by Republicans in Congress who said she was trying to um, promote policy by calling for more protective measures. Um, she had all of her emails subpoenaed. She, you know, she really went through a hard time, but she is just now retired. This is another study. Um, this one is out of Harvard. Uh, they were looking at consumption of high pesticide residues, and they found um, some associations with... Uh, pregnancy problems and live birth problems and things like that. So again, they're saying we need to understand that these dietary exposures um, you know, can be dangerous for us and we need more study. You know, the companies say we have to have these pesticides to feed the world. There's actually a scientist out there who says, you know what, wouldn't you rather die of cancer than starvation? You know, we, we need to feed the world. Well, you don't. The data doesn't support that. Um, the United Nations weighed in on this um, a couple of years ago, and, and it said the very same thing. The data doesn't support that this is essential 
to food security. There are a whole lot of other things that have to do with food scarcity. Uh, the ability to access you know, special seeds and pesticides is not one of them. Um, excessive use of pesticides are very dangerous to human health, to the environment, and it's misleading to claim they are vital to ensuring food security. And I just have to point out, if you don't care about your own health and you don't care about your kids' health, we're losing the birds. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is like the canary in the coal mine or, you know, birds are, are vanishing. The bird populations, you've probably, there have been stories recently all of this year about this, but this is showing just in North America, this decline of 29%. Um, and they're associating this uh, with pesticide use and other factors. Insect population, plummeting insect numbers. Insects, you know, we may not like them. You may want to squash the spider or, you know, but they are so important in so many ways um, to biodiversity and to the food production system. We're losing pollinators that are essential um, to many of the foods that we regularly put on our plates. And they, again, um, this tie to widespread pesticide use uh, is, is um, attributed to this decline. So I think it's fitting, you know, Rachel Carson, let's quote her again and let's look at this. And if she says, if having endured much, we have at last asserted our right to know, and if by knowing we have concluded that we are being asked to take senseless and frightening risks, then we should no longer accept the counsel of those who tell us that we must fill our world with poisonous chemicals. We should look about and see what other course is open to us. And I think that lesson from so many decades ago is probably more needed, you know, today. A um, couple of shameless plugs. This is the group I uh, work for now. I left Reuters uh, in 2016 and went to work for this little tiny nonprofit called U.S. Right to Know. And what we do is primarily file Freedom of Information Act requests and sue the government if they don't turn over the documents and uh, take on universities and try to try to get the truth and the transparency that we think that consumers need. Um, CrossFit was, uh, has been a supporter and, and been a donor and very grateful for that. This is my other shameless plug. This is my book, Whitewash. I call it not, it's not a feel-good story. It definitely isn't. People don't read it and say, oh, I feel so light and happy now. Um, but, you know, I think it's useful. Um, it's a book Monsanto doesn't want you to read. They filed this uh, in court in the first trial. Um, this was a motion to exclude my book from being used as evidence. And this is the spreadsheet they put together before my book came out to discredit my book. Um, Project Spruce, Cary Gillum Book Plan. And it involved all sorts of subversive activities, <laughs> like putting things, manipulating search engine optimization on Google so that interesting things about me pop up if you Google my name and getting, you know, trying to get negative book reviews posted by independent people um, on Amazon and things like that. So it's been an interesting ride. And that's all. Thank you so much.